Hello, guys. Hello. Hey, let's. Uh, I want you to undivided attention, please. Everybody needs to wear a mask. It's that's mandatory. Uh, please make sure you have your masks on. That's mandatory in the university. I want the students. I want to see everybody with a mask. So, first of all, uh, I wanted to welcome. Although this technical problem, you know, uh, uh, delay a little bit of us, you know. Uh, Fabio and I, uh, we are good friends for many years. Fabio is the director of business analytics of Microsoft in Redmond. So he does all the global analytics uh, of Microsoft programs and partners at a global level. So we go, we're friends for, I don't know, 20 years, uh, well, a very long time. I used to work for Microsoft for like many years as well. Um, and I think that artificial intelligence is an area that today there's a lot of mystery. A lot of you guys in business or healthcare or IT, it's very confusing. People don't have a clear picture about what artificial intelligence means. And what I asked Fabio to put together is more like a, a preamble, an introduction of artificial intelligence. Why and how artificial intelligence will bring value or, or is bringing value to the business. And why sometimes it's so mysterious. Because still today, uh, many individuals, uh, many of of you or professionals, etc., they, they feel that artificial intelligence seems like very geeky. I have no clue about it. And Fabi is going to show some tools that exist today which are very easy to use. And any of you, at any time, with, with or without technical background, can start using it, right? So um, because of the problem with the return on the echo, I won't be able to ask questions and back and forth. So what I'm going to do, I wanted to talk to Fabio, so he starts the presentation. It's not very long, and then once uh, we finish, uh, we'll have some chance for questions, etc. Right? So, but first of all, thanks for coming. I think it's a very important topic uh, for any of you from now to the future. Um, artificial intelligence, machine learning is not just reporting or generating graphs or pie charts. That's what we do like from 40 years ago, 40 years ago. So it's a little bit it's different. It's looking about how things are going to behave. Um, in terms of predictability or, or trends or uh, insights into the data to make decisions, good or bad, based on what you're looking for outcomes, right? So anyway, without further ado, uh, Fabio, can you hear me or not? Yes, I can. Thank you for having me. Sorry for the, uh, the technical difficulties. But uh, uh, what I wanted to do today is just to give you a, a brief overview of what I do uh, at Microsoft and also uh, share some tools and techniques that you can use even from uh, when you get back home, you can uh, load these applications in uh, your own PC and uh, you can run this um, uh, machine learning model uh, right you know, uh, from your uh, home computer without uh, any elaborate setup. So um, at Microsoft, like uh, Alex mentioned, I do uh, business analytics, global business analytics, uh, looking at all the different businesses at Microsoft. And uh, what uh, really inspired me uh, to do one specific line of work uh, were some words that uh, our CEO Satya Nadella uh, added to his book, uh, which is Hit Refresh. Um, and he says that we need to build deeper empathy for our customers and then their unarticulated and unmet needs. It was time to hit refresh. So historically, we uh, used customer satisfaction surveys that uh, um, we try to collect feedback, just like uh, you know, in, in the university, you have uh, student surveys, you have uh, you know, professor surveys to understand what's going on. People can uh, give suggestions. People can give us a score uh, about different aspects of their experience with the university, in, the, in our case, with Microsoft. But the challenge is uh, not everybody wants to uh, respond to a technical, but not a technical, but a, a business-oriented uh, survey. Like uh, uh, what I'm talking about is what is a Starbucks satisfaction with uh, Microsoft, right? So we don't have this type of feedback from every single customer. So um, traditionally, uh, our account teams that work with uh, close with the customers would only respond uh, when uh, the customer provided feedback. 
Now, using AI and machine learning, what I can do is uh, look at all the experience that the customer has with Microsoft, um, the purchases, the uh, um, technical support cases that they open, everything that we know about the customer uh, is in a central database. And I can feed this database with uh, the intelligence that we get from uh, only the say 20% of customers that do participate in the survey. And then uh, we train a machine learning model to look at all the data points that we have about uh, the customer and find the patterns that makes customer happy or unhappy. So once we train that machine learning model, we can score all the customers, right, at any given time and uh, anticipate if they are having a good experience with Microsoft or not. So the future of uh, customer uh, experience management at Microsoft, which is one of my core uh, interests, is to be proactive instead of waiting for uh, a customer to send us a survey response, we actually can, using machine learning, infer if the customer needs help and uh, uh, ask them if um, they need a help with a particular aspect of their relationship with Microsoft and uh, actually surprise them in a good sense, uh, saying, hey, we're here to help you be successful. It's not just about sales. So this is, what I interpret on the unarticulated needs that our customers have. They don't tell that problem to their account managers, they don't answer the survey, but using artificial intelligence, we have an opportunity to unlock that knowledge. And that's uh, my core uh, business at Microsoft. So, I, it looks like the slides are, are kind of messed up. I don't know if uh, uh, it's just my screen, but uh, let's see if uh, that works. Um, first, I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of definitions. Um, one uh, is what is artificial intelligence versus machine learning versus deep learning. And I just want to do that just to make sure that we are all um, on the same page when we talk ab about uh, machine learning in the next slides. So first is data science. When we talk about data sciences, all the science that goes into looking at data of all these different natures and, um, and make sense of the data, right? And it includes traditional reporting like uh, Alex mentioned, but it includes today artificial intelligence in everything. So it's a, the big term uh, data science. Then inside uh, data science, we have uh, what we call artificial intelligence, which is something that tries to emulate the way that our brains uh, work internally. So computers do not understand the real world. They only understand numbers. So we have to come up with uh, um, math mathematical models that represent nature. And uh, that's a, one of the things that I'm going to try to remove that stigma of what that means. Um, then machine learning. Machine learning is inside artificial intelligence. Uh, and it has to do with prediction of outcomes. Uh, you can use for speech recognition, image recognition, uh, computer vision, all that stuff. Then inside machine learning, we have a specific branch, which is called um, deep learning. In deep learning, we really uh, use neural networks to really get closer to the simulation of a human brain. Uh, we create mathematical models to represent each one of the neurons and each one of the synapses uh, that connect uh, neuron to neuron. And these mathematical models can be run uh, using computers. And as you saw earlier today, computers are really dumb. Uh, they cannot even play Zoom well. However, they're super fast. Uh, so they can simulate these neural networks at extreme speeds. So we can leverage that in order to um, teach computers how to think. 
And the, the last um, uh, element here uh, in terms of terminology is robotics. Robotics is uh, interesting because it's not just uh, something passive that uh, is on your computer screen, but there's actuation in the environment. It's something that can change the environment. So I'm talking about uh, automatic uh, uh, driving cars. We're talking about uh, manufacturing um, and uh, things that actually change the world uh, around them, right? Uh, not just images on your screen. So this is all uh, part of uh, data science and uh, engineering mathematics. So this is uh, really a, a convergence of different disciplines in science. Now, the big question is, how do computer, computers really work or learn, right? Like I mentioned, computers only think numbers, right? So there is a difference between what we normally uh, use computer for versus what, how we, we teach a machine, right? In the, the traditional approach to programming a computer, uh, you start with a bunch of inputs that can be uh, customer records, for example, and then business rules. That is, when this happens, that needs to happen. And you have a, a sequence of if-then conditions, if this, then that, if this, then that, that the programmer has to code inside the computer in form of a software, right? And uh, when this happens, then you, you begin to produce the results. So you actually program the logic uh, to transform inputs into results using rules. Now, in machine learning, things happen very differently. You start with inputs as well. However, you have examples uh, attached to the inputs of what the results should be. For example, if, this, this, uh, if the data looks like this, then the customer is going to leave. If the data uh, looks like this, the customer is going to stay um, as a customer for my company. So we don't know the logic. We don't know what's going on in the data, what causes customer to leave uh, our company. Um, but we have a bunch of examples of customers that have been with us for many years versus customers that decided to be for the competition. We feed this into a piece of software that instead of allowing us as humans to find the rules and program uh, a piece of software, it figured out all the rules by itself. So with a series of examples, then the machine figure out by itself all the rules. And uh, it does this in a, such a complex way that typically we treat this as a black box. We don't know uh, how all these things is, uh, are connected together. We know that if we uh, put inputs, we are getting results that make business sense. So you don't have to figure out the rules. You just have to have enough data to train the machine to figure out uh, the rules by itself. Now, there are many different techniques that you can use. Uh, there are uh, what we call supervised learning. Supervised learning, it, it, it's a follow the example type of approach. Here is the input. This is the corresponding output. Figure out the rules, just like I mentioned in the previous slide. But we also have unsupervised um, methods, which um, looking at the data, for example, uh, groups customers that look like one another, and uh, you, then you can figure out uh, what are the similarities between these groups of customers, and then you provide a type of service, you offer a type of product, et cetera, that makes more sense to one group versus the other. So this is customer segmentation. What you can do with this is, okay, this is my customer base, everything that I know about these customers, create five uh, groups uh, using my customers so I can figure out a strategy in working with these similar customers, right? Five different strategies, five different approaches to engaging uh, each one of these five groups. 
So you don't have to figure out what are the rules? Is it revenue? Is it geographical location? What is the most appropriate way to segregate the customers into groups? The machine does that for you. So a customer can be, for example, in Miami, another one here in Redmond, uh, in Seattle. Uh, they are in completely different businesses. The one is uh, a retail customer, another one is a manufacturing customer. But they look sufficiently similar to one another that the same approach would work. And this is something that you couldn't figure out by you know, just the experience, right? This is something that only um, uh, something like this can uh, help you uh, accomplish. And this is uh, what I call the Fabio's machine learning process. Um, there are 10 steps that I use uh, when it comes to machine learning. Everything begins with understanding the business problem. Uh, if you don't understand what you're trying to solve, uh, you cannot do anything, right? So the first thing is to really understand the problem, ask questions. If the problem is not clear enough, then uh, ask more questions, try to quantify the expected result. For example, I want to predict uh, how many customers are going to churn in the next six months. I said, fine, but what is the accuracy? that you want me to provide? Do you want a 90%, 95% accuracy, or is it 80% good enough, right? And that will dictate how much data I'm going to need uh, and what are the techniques that I'm going to use. Then the second point is gather and prepare data. Uh, this sounds also trivial, but uh, in that project that I mentioned um, about uh, predicting customer satisfaction at Microsoft, I spent uh, steps two and three and four. Two, three, and four, I spent about three years doing just that. Uh, I had to connect uh, different systems together uh, in order to get all the information that I needed, understand the data, only then uh, go to the next step, which is actually do the machine learning work. Now, there are many, many techniques and options that you can apply uh, once you have the data clean and ready for the data scientists. Uh, and you have to try, there's a, a mix of science and art. Some experience helps a lot. If you solve many problems before, uh, it's likely that you are going to make a good judgment and a good, uh, make good selections, but you ha still have to experiment. Uh, you try um, a certain algorithm, uh, you bring in more data, you try it, uh, you evaluate the performance. I'm gonna get, am I getting that 95% accuracy that uh, is required or am I getting only 80%? If that is not enough, you have to go back a few steps and uh, uh, until you solve the problem. And sometimes you feel like uh, this guy on a, on, a, on a hamster wheel, really spinning uh, between this um, you know, one and 10 uh, for a long time. And sometimes you can uh, get to a conclusion that I, maybe I don't have the, uh, the right data, it's, it's not enough to solve the problem. I have to go back to step number one and renegotiate the problem statement. Then uh, just to give you an idea what, uh, what it takes uh, in, in the, the uh, data collection, uh, here is, is a classic example. This is like uh, when you learn to play the guitar, everybody learns to play Stairway to Heaven. Right, so this iris data set is kind of the stairway to heaven of data science. Everybody has seen this. But the idea is how can I differentiate uh, these three types of irises um, using machine learning, for example, right? Uh, visually, they don't look a lot different, uh, different, but you can see that the proportions of the petals uh, and sepals are a little bit different in each one of these species. So you have to transform the flowers into numbers 
so we can uh, fit into a machine learning model. And here is where actually human intelligence comes in before uh, artificial intelligence. You have to figure out how to transform these pictures in numbers. So one simple technique is to measure the length and the width of the sepals and the petals. So you have uh, these proportions you throw into a table and uh, say, okay, uh, I measure these numbers and it was a virginica species, these numbers and it was a setosa. And this is the data that I collect from, from nature, right? And then uh, the next step is to have a, a group of these data sets that is going to be used for training and uh, another one for testing. We want to tr uh, train the model with the training data and then test uh, with um, uh, data that you already know to make sure that the model is performing uh, accordingly. So this is um, the, just the fundamentals before we get into how do, do you do machine learning? And uh, what I have to say is that uh, machine learning is a piece of cake nowadays. Uh, 25 years, almost 30 years ago, when uh, I started thinking about artificial intelligence, uh, when I was in college, uh, things were very, very different. Uh, today, you, you can go two paths. Uh, either use a traditional approach, which is uh, the uh, like a baking a cake from scratch, right? Uh, which is using all these manual tools, or you can use uh, the, the, the cake mix, which is to use these uh, modern tools that uh, 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 can solve these problems in just a few clicks. And uh, the same way that uh, if I decided to bake a cake to, for my grandma, and I said, well, I'm going to use a Betty Crocker cake mix. She would uh, flip on me. Um, the traditionalists in data science, meaning people that do, does data science at least uh, five years ago, uh, will say, nope, that's not the way to do data science. You have to really do everything from scratch. But I beg to differ. Uh, today, we don't have time to go over all the details of these tools but hopefully we will have a, a more opportunity to, uh, to talk. But these are the tools today that you can use and you can solve these problems without writing a single line of code. You have, um, uh, for example, the Azure Machine Learning, which my Microsoft produces. You have Exploratory, which is a visual tool that does really cool stuff. Uh, driverless AI is like a, the, the mother of all data science tools. Uh, it costs a lot of money, but can solve really big problems. This is uh, the, uh, the software that I, that I actually use on a daily basis to solve my business problems. And uh, there is Orange. Uh, this is the data tool that is free. It is super interesting how to use it that I was planning to uh, share the details with you today. But you can download this um, in, um, in your computers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to record a video that uh, can, you know, walking you through all the, um, you know, how to solve a problem in Orange and I'll share with Alex so he can include in, um, you know, this is slides that uh, it's going to go out to you after, uh, after the meeting, okay? So, because we have only a couple of minutes, Alex, uh, I don't know if there is time to for questions, but uh, I just wanted to leave, um, you know, with uh, this uh, this promise that I'm going to uh, shoot a, a quick video uh, doing a, a demo with Orange solving a, a business problem and send it back to you. But I wanted to make sure that people understood some basic concepts before I did that. Fabio, I want to see if anybody has a question or a comment or something. Yeah, go ahead. I think we can speak over here, I hope. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So actually, I have two questions for you. So the first question is an assumption and a question. So, like there are two, two, like two school in the AI. The one that is like going, uh, 
to study like the, the natural processing language and the computer vision. And there is another school that is studying the human brain. So my assumption is this. I believe that the human brain is, uh, is made and by like ERC as an evolution. And we should focus more on the computer vision and that natural processing language. What do you think about this? So um, I agree with you. Um, I don't think the, uh, the human mind is sophisticated enough to understand itself. Uh, what we can do is create some really uh, approximations. I don't know if uh, the models that we use today is close enough or really far away and completely wrong. But there's a, a, an interesting saying in computer science in, in general that is, uh, and even in math, that uh, every model is wrong. Some of them are useful, right? So the models that we have about the brain and the, the neurons are useful enough for uh, uh, us to solve some problems. And we do use these models to actually solve problems like I have on the screen, which is <clears throat> to look at those x-rays and tell if the customer has uh, pneumonia or even COVID today, we can detect by uh, using machine learning uh, trained with uh, x-rays that were um, diagnosed by uh, experts in the area. Right, and this is uh, what, something that I'm going to show you how to do uh, without writing a, a single line of code, just leveraging uh, all the science that was developed in, uh, under, in our poor understanding of the brain. Um, imagine if we have more understanding of how our brains work, um, applying to artificial intelligence would be fantastic. But I completely agree with you. Any other questions from anybody? Oh. So he has another question. So my second question is this. We're still in a, in a, like in a level of narrow artificial intelligence. And like it's going to be a phenomenal technology for the future. But what do you think about this? The day that somebody is going to reach the general artificial intelligence and like it's not a, like a really good person, it's going to take this artificial intelligence and it's going to put it in a decentralized system. Uh, it's not going to be dangerous for the world, this? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. So, uh, yes, I think uh, that is potentially um, an issue. There are several people that are much smarter than I am, like uh, Elon Musk, for example, that has this um, you know, idea that uh, we need to be careful because someday, uh, general uh, intelligence will be available and that could become a threat. However, when he says that, he is predicting something that might or might not happen maybe 300 years from now, 400 years from now. It's not something that is imminent. However, there should be some sort of um, uh, regulation on the industry to prevent that from uh, even, uh, ever happening. Like. Uh, the guy that invented dynamite, uh, he didn't expect dynamite to be used the way that it, it was. Um, and uh, he donated all the money that he made uh, creating uh, the dynamite to the Nobel Prize. Nobel uh, is the name of the guy that invented dynamite and he uh, suffered uh, you know, to see the consequence of uh, his invention. Um, so chances are that uh, you know AI could become the um, the dynamite in the future. Um, I don't see this happening anytime soon. We will still have a very 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 narrow intelligence. That was uh, another part of the demonstration that I wanted to uh, to show you today. Uh, one of the models is to identify cats and dogs. Uh, so you, you train the machine to identify those two animals. And then just for fun, you throw in a, a different, completely different animal, like a lion. And uh, how does the, uh, the, uh, the neural network uh, figure out what the picture is, right? And uh, because I guess from uh, all the Pomeranian pictures that I had in the data set, it figured out that the lion was a dog. 
And uh, he didn't use the kind of logic that a human would use. Say, well, it's a, it's a big cat, but it has a big, big hair, right? So uh, uh, yeah, computers, again, continue to be done as a, a piece of silicon, um, but um, they might become a threat in the future. I, I believe that, but it's going to take some time. Yeah, so any other question from anybody? So I think Fabio can hear me uh, from there because I think he's mute, right, uh, Nibo? He's mute now? He's mute. Yeah, yeah, so he can hear me. Yeah, so, I can hear you. so first of all, I want to thank Fabio for the time uh, to present us today. I think it was great uh, to hear a little bit somebody from Microsoft to come and talk to us about an area that is growing uh, tremendously. Uh, all of you without exception uh, in business or healthcare or IT, you will be dealing with artificial intelligence. You're already dealing with that. But as Fabio was saying, um, today is very narrow. So what we say, there's a lot of hype. Uh, there's a lot of hype about what AI or intelligence means. Uh, everything is smart, smart key, smart house, smart this, smart that. But they're really, really limited in what they do realistically, right? So we are far away from that, uh, like what you've seen in, in the movies. And what you're mentioning about that, about the central thing, Max Tegmat was one of the physicians. He has a book on, on talk about that. And maybe artificial intelligence will become this big monster and will control the world and all the machines will enslave humans and we will be like you know, slaves to a master machine. This, is, this works well in science fiction, but works very poorly in reality because as, as uh, Fabio was saying, the, the data and the amount of dependencies that generate context, that's how we humans operate. Machines are far, they are not even close to what we call context. So uh, if you put an Excel spreadsheet with a million questions and answers, I can make you think that is a very intelligent people, a very intelligent person behind. And you, any question, maybe a million questions, how are you, are you doing well, why do you study, where you live, imagine that, and the, the answer comes from this Excel spreadsheet, you'll say, wow, this is so smart, but there's no, there's just coded rule, right? So anyway, so uh, I wanted to thank you all for the participation, it has been a pleasure. Uh, sorry for the technical glitches, but it makes things more interesting, because yeah, that's what we try to do, solve the problem, right? Um, and if you have questions or comments, uh, I'm looking forward to hear more from you. Um, and um, um, any, any, any comments from anybody before we close for the night? You know. If not, Anibal, thanks very much for your help. Guys, thanks for the participation. <laughs>